if life was fair, and if, if karma is really a thing, at least in this life, then Teodoro, Obiang, Nguema, Mbasogo would not be alive. This last week, there was a, a pretty important anniversary in the East Afri- or West African nation of Equatorial Guinea. Uh, it has been 40 years since Nguema seized power from his uncle in a bloody coup. Now, his uncle was an absolute tyrant. He was a paranoid maniac who, just for an example, one day decided that he did not like intellectuals, and so anyone seen wearing glasses would be shot. And Nguema the Younger promised that this would come to an end. That's how he raised his support. So he promised democracy. He promised freedom. He promised judicial reform. He promised help for the poor of his nation, one of the least developed nations of the world. And at last, it seemed 40 years ago that hope and change had come to that country. Except that it didn't. After seizing power, Nguema kept the the, the press firmly under his control. Political opposition parties were banned. Education and health care in the country remained at the absolute worst on the African continent. And it's not because of a lack of money. It's not because of the exploitation of colonial powers. See, in the mid-90s, huge oil reserves were discovered in the country, raising the GDP to among the highest levels among African nations. But all that money was appropriated into the personal fortunes of Nguema and his friends, and none of it trickled down to the people. Through the control of the media... Nguema established a maniacal cult to himself. In 2003, state media declared that Nguema was now God in the flesh. And that by right of being God, he can do whatever he wishes with complete legal and moral impunity. There are no human rights as far as Nguema is concerned. There have been elections in the country, four elections so far, and every year he wins by almost 100% because he is the only candidate on the ballot. There have been assassination, assassination attempts, but by some miracle, he always manages to escape and survive. The international community has sought to hold him to account by seizing his planes and his yachts and his supercars and his homes in places like Paris and Los Angeles and other locations around the world. But compared to his vast fortune in the billions of dollars, these are just a drop in the bucket. And life continues to be good. And even more, despite everything he's done, he continues to live and celebrate this 40th anniversary of reigning in terror. And if life was fair, this would not be the case that he should live. If life was fair, there are others who have passed who would still be with us. This next week, on Tuesday, we're going to have another anniversary it will be four months since a brother very much loved to this church Dave Treadway passed for those of you who are visiting who maybe don't know his name Dave was a true legend and that is not an exaggeration he was a legend in the snow sport community um He was known around the world for his superhuman skiing and snowmobiling uh, talents. And even more than that, this man was passionately on fire for the gospel. He wore the gospel on his sleeve. He wore the cross on his helmet. He was not at all ashamed to tell people about the hope and the joy within him that come from knowing Jesus. 
He is a husband and a father. Had two boys and a third on the way who's since now been born. He was meticulous in regards to planning and safety and making sure that whatever risks he took, everything was, was mitigated to the best of his ability. He was, even more importantly, he was faithful in prayer every day, asking that God would protect him, that God would protect his family. But one day, April 15th, he's standing on a glacier up in Pemberton and the ground just opens up under his feet. And that was it. He was gone. And his memorial service was beautiful, but one thing I kept hearing people saying is how is this fair? How is it fair that so many should live despite all their recklessness, despite all of the evil things they do, and this dude who was a righteous dude gets taken. Those that didn't say it, they were thinking it, right? We all thought that. In my own family right now, we are wrestling with this same unfairness. I've been, I've mentioned before that my uncle has a form of cancer called glioma. And uh, it's very aggressive. It just keeps coming and keeps coming. And, you know, he has fought the good fight. The, 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 dent, the, uh, the medical professionals have done everything they could for him. He's had all the surgeries, all the chemo, all the radiation. And now the doctors have said, it's just comfort measures from here on out. Another righteous dude. A husband. A father of four teenage kids, two boys, two girls. He's the moderator at his church. He is a generous and passionate supporter of missions. Just truly a godly man. It shouldn't be like this. It's, it's, it's not fair. So what do we do with this? Right? How, how does our faith cope with this? You know, religious religion gives the expectation that if you are devout, if, if, if you are a prayerful person, if you do good and you resist the temptation to do evil, you will be better off than those that don't. But what happens when expectation and reality don't meet? What happens when from no fault of our own, our lives are invaded with pain? And I'm not just talking about physical pain. Yes, that includes sickness. It includes injury. It also includes relational pain. What happens when we are ostracized, when we are hated through no fault of our own, when our hearts are broken? What happens when, despite all of our best efforts to stay healthy, our our bodies begin to fail us? What happens when death and sickness strike our family despite the fact that we pray every day for their protection? Can faith survive that disconnect between expectation and reality? Sadly, it it often does not. I've seen my share of that. I've seen people give up when life gets real. Ecclesiastes is not an easy book to read. It's not an easy book to understand, and it is not... Uh, how do I put this, emotionally palatable. But it is good for us. And it's, it's written uh, to prepare us for some of these hard realities of life. It's given to us so that we will be equipped for our faith to survive life in a Genesis 3 world. Life in a world that is profoundly unfair. 
a world that is often futile, a word that is, as the teacher, the, the speaker in Ecclesiastes puts it, meaningless. So this, this morning we're going to look at just the first six verses of chapter 9. Kelvin read them a minute ago and you were raising your eyebrows and scratching your head. That's what we're going to look at. And, and here are the two points that we get to take home here from this. The first is that you are not in control. And the second is that where there is life, there is hope. So let's look at the first thing. You are not in control. Verse 1. So I reflected on all this and I concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. What's he saying here? He's saying that good and bad things, they happen to everyone. Even if we are wise and even if we are righteous, there are no guarantees that we are going to get through life without some measure of both good and bad, both love and hate. And and that relational hardship is going to strike all of us to some degree. You know, it's a nice thought that if if I do everything right on my end as a friend, as a neighbor, as a follower of Jesus, as a child of God, that I will be protected, that I will not get hurt in this life. But if you're like me, you come to a certain point in your life where life has happened and you have to do a post-mortem on a broken relationship. It might be a broken friendship, it might be a broken career, it might be a broken family, and when you come to that point, you say to yourself, I did everything that I could, but I can't fix it. And then you're going to say, God, I trusted you, but you didn't fix it. And then you're going to have this nagging thought in your head. Maybe this faith isn't working for me. Maybe maybe I'm just better off doing my own thing. You know, the Bible, it does give us a lot of very practical wisdom on how we can live the way that God intended for us to live. And when you live the way that uh, God intends you to live, you can avoid a lot of uh, destructive behaviors, right? Right? That you can save yourself from a lot of pain and a lot of agony by just not being stupid and doing what God tells you to do. But we need to understand this, and we need to understand this very clearly. There are no guarantees that we're going to get through life unscathed. In this broken world, any one of us can be hit by suffering and by pain and by heart, having our hearts broken at any time, and we will not necessarily know why it happens. But the author of Ecclesiastes tells us that we should expect that it will at some point. If you live in this world in this Genesis 3 world, you are just as likely as anyone to experience relational pain, sickness, grief, sadness, and even death. Look at the next verse, verse 2. The teacher says, All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those do not, who do not. As it is with the good, so it is with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. See, all of this unfairness, it would seem to prove to us that religion is a complete waste of time. Because our lives are not necessarily going to be any better for it. Like, where's the upside? Like, if God really loves us, why should we not expect that he will come through for us and, and answer our prayers? Right? You ever had those thoughts? You'd almost think that the, the, uh, 
the writer here in Ecclesiastes is, is like trying to trigger doubt in us. He's pushing our buttons, but he's doing it not because he's wanting to destroy our faith, but because he's wanting to expose something about it. He's doing it to expose our need for control. He's doing, using it to show us how in our relationship with God, we don't let him be God. We use him as a means to our own end. And so the way that works is we say, okay, if I keep God happy by doing godly stuff, he will keep me happy by doing what I ask him to do. This is how religion is supposed to work, but this is not actually how a genuine relationship with the living God works. In a real relationship with God, God gets to be God. I'm going to use here a a lengthy quote from Ian Provan because he just expresses this so much better than I ever could. Listen to what he says. Over and against what is claimed in much modern pseudo-Christian theology... The Bible never promises that any human being will know in this life only good health, financial prosperity, and happiness. Moreover, it certainly never ties faith and righteousness to the attainment of these things in any simplistic way. It is true that the way of faith and obedience to God is in the end a blessed way. And God's blessings can include good health financial prosperity, and happiness. It is untrue, however, that the faithful and obedient person will only and ever possess such things and can somehow be sure of avoiding illness, disaster, and death if he or she can simply muster enough religious devotion. To believe this is to believe something profoundly unbiblical. To teach it is to insult every Christian throughout the past 2,000 years who has known illness, poverty, and misery, and to press on it the sick, the poor, and the unhappy of the present day is, is to place a millstone around the neck of those who are drowning rather than offer them the comfort and the hope of the gospel. God is much more concerned to make us holy and to shape us in the image of Christ than he is to make us happy, rich, and healthy. Kohelet, that's the teacher, emphasizes that each of us is destined to experience both good and evil, both love and hate, both misery along with the effects of folly and joy along with the effects of wisdom, and to, in the end to know death. And in doing so, he is speaking the truth, a truth widely proclaimed elsewhere in the scriptures. And at the center of the biblical story is the Savior himself. He walked a pilgrim path, lacking a place to lay his head. And although he did heal the sick, he certainly did not teach that faith and in an obedience to God bring inevitably in their wake prosperity, health, and happiness. Rather, he warned his disciples to beware of wealth and to know that they would face constant threats to life and limb. Jesus' own life was a life marked by alienation, pain, and eventually death, and his followers could not avoid a similar fate. The Apostle Paul is a good example, knowing constant danger, frequent need, ever-present illness, which prayer to God did not affect. His conclusion from this last experience was not that his faith was weak or that God did not exist but that God's power was being revealed in his weakness. He goes on to say something that those who are devotees of, devotees of modern pseudo-gospels can never say. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insult, in hardships, and in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Biblical faith is not about control. Nor is it about manipulation of God so that God will do as we wish. It is idolatry, not true faith, that has as its heart control and manipulation. See, 
a real faith where God gets to be God is one that will be resilient in the face of pain, resilient in the face of heartbreak. It'll stand, tr- it'll stand tough when life happens. It can handle disappointment. It can hold on to hope even through hurt. It understands that we live in a Genesis 3 world, but it has its eyes firmly set on the fact that we are coming into a Revelation 21 world. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more death. Eternity in the presence of God. But real faith recognizes that the only way we experience that blessing is if God is in control and we are not. The only way we find real flourishing and real hope is by putting our lives in his hands and saying, in my poverty as much as my prosperity, in my sickness as much as my health, in my being loved as much as being rejected, in my living and in my dying, Be glorified. Not my will, but yours be done. You know, we are every day praying for a miracle for my Uncle Philip. Every day we hold on to the hope that where medical science has come to its end, God will do something to dramatically change the situation. We believe that God is able. We believe that God loves him. We believe that God is good. But we can never get away from that question, what happens when we, on the day that we are standing at his graveside? What will we say then? We will say that God is good. We will say that God is powerful. We will say that God loves him. We will worship. Because even when the answer to our specific prayers is no or not yet, we can trust that whatever he does is always for our good. He is working all things together for the good of those who love him. We don't know whether God will heal his cancer, but we know that he is making all things new and the day will come in the new heaven and the new earth where there will not be cancer anymore. I think that deserves an amen. Yeah. The day will come when there will not be depression anymore, when, when there will not be striving or weeping anymore. There will not be death anymore. You know, whether, whether or not he actually does get healed, we know that, that death is as certain as taxes, right? But God will destroy death itself. All the pain, all the sorrow of the Genesis 3 world gone forever. And here's the thing. Only God can bring that to be. Only God can do that. I can't do that. I don't know what I actually need for my own good. I don't know what it will take for history to be directed toward that end. Only he knows that. If my greatest good depends on me being in control, telling God what to do. You know what? I don't have any hope. I do not have any hope. I can't see how everything fits together. If God is in control, then no matter what happens, I can say that it is well with my soul. The truth that you are not in control is actually the best 
thing you could ever hear. Even though that presents itself as a threat to us, as a threat to our autonomy. But it is the good news. The second point the teacher makes is that where there is life, there is hope. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. He says, this is the evil that in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil. And there is madness in their hearts while they live. And afterward they go to join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. So the teacher here is telling us that the brokenness that we see and experience in this world is intimately linked with the brokenness in our own soul. Everyone experiences hurt and pain in this world because all of us are, are living and walking out of step with the God that made us. When creation is out of step with its creator, death happens. And that's not very positive or hopeful. Um, but then in verse 4, he throws us a bone. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Now, we need to do a little bit of cultural ex- exegesis here because we need to understand that um, as much as we love dogs uh, and their wonderful uh, pets and, and members of our family, 3,000 years ago, domestication wasn't very far along. So they did not think of dogs very positively. If you want to understand how people in the ancient world thought of dogs, like picture uh, hyenas or jackals. Yeah, that. And I, I know... Those of you who like to nitpick the details, I know that hyenas are not dogs, okay? But that's how people would have thought of that. A a, a mongrel, flea-bitten creature that skulks around and nips and yips at its its other dogs and something that is just very uh, undignified. The exact opposite of how people then and now think of, of lions commanding power and respect. Uh, Think Mufasa. I don't think I need to say any more. But here's the teacher's point. Even though, I apologize, even though you are a dog, afflicted by trouble from the outside and completely infected by sin on the inside, at least you are alive. At least you are alive. You could be dignified and respected in death. The only problem is that you would not get to experience any of that. But whatever state you are in, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what's been done to you or what you have done, there is hope for you because you are living. You have the ability to recognize the finiteness of your life. Recognize that one day your mortal life will come to an end and you have the ability because you are living now to ask that question, then what? You have hope because you by virtue of being alive, have an opportunity to respond to the God that made you. See, throughout this whole book of Ecclesiastes, the the author has been hitting home the idea over and over that everything we do, everything that we chase over the course of our lives, it's all meaningless. It's empty. It's a vapor that's here one moment and gone the next. He's making that point and telling us that everything under the sun is meaningless so that we will look for meaning and permanence in something else that will not fail us. 
at the end of the book, in chapter 12, um, the author closes by challenging us. He says, remember your creator. Remember your creator while you are still young because, you know what, your life will one day fall apart. Your body will one day fall apart. The very world that you inhabit is going to fall apart. So remember your creator. Look for your purpose, your meaning, your happiness, and your satisfaction in something, in someone beyond life under the sun before it is too late. See, each of us has been given the opportunity to experience something more than meaningless. Our creator invites us to transcend life under the sun and have eternal life. A life that will not, like a vapor, fade away. Jesus says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. That invitation is given to you so that you can have hope, so that you can have joy, so that you can have peace, but even more, so that you can live. And even though everything else falls apart, your good does not have to. Let's pray. Father, We humbly confess that you are God and we are not. Each one of us carries a heavy weight of situations in our lives that we wish we could change but are, are simply beyond our control. Lord, would your spirit teach us to rest in your hands. Would your spirit teach us to turn our eyes upon Jesus? And know that your will is our greatest good. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.